Okay, so we had we had uh, uh, done um, part four of the epistle on resurrection, and um, he's now getting into the question of what can be interpreted allegorically and what can be interpreted, um, what has to be interpreted literally. Obviously, the Rambam is known for allegorical interpretation of certain things, um, certainly things about God. Um, but also things about the Messiah, for instance. He said, uh, what does it mean, you know, at the end of the Mishnah Torah, when he says the Messiah, time of the Messiah will be a natural time, says, what do we do with the verses that say the wolf will lie down with the lamb? So he says that's metaphor for that the Jewish people and their enemies will have peace. Um, and then, and and so the question that's lying really, sort of the elephant in the room is why not, if the Rambam you know, seems to totally believe that reward and punishment is in the next world and not at the time of the Messiah, and that he has problems with the resurrection of the dead. Why doesn't he just interpret the prophetic verses talk about the resurrection of the dead at the time of the Messiah um, allegorically? So, uh, you know, it partly seems like he would like to, but but there's clearly pressure on him not, you know, to take it literally. And he says, um, I will explain in this treatise, why these scriptural passages are not interpreted allegorically, meaning about the resurrection of the dead, even though we interpret many other passages in the Torah allegorically. Thus, the resurrection of the dead, which is the return of the soul to the body after death, as mentioned by Daniel, cannot be interpreted allegorically, right? He says, I believe in it. Um, and he writes, um, for the life following which uh, there is no death. If the life in the world to come is the life in the world to come is the life in the world to come. In other words, what you might have is he says here a resurrection of the dead, um, and then the people die. Uh, it's also apparent from those Talmudic statements that these individual souls will return to their bodies after death, will eat and drink, engage in sexual intercourse, desire children, and die after extremely long life, like the life which will exist in the time of the Messiah. Uh, further, and then they're going to go to the world to come, or back to the world to come. Um, you know, he had also said here, uh, uh, it's asserted about us that we said that the scriptural passages about the resurrection of the dead are allegorical. This is a widespread falsehood and totally false statement. Our writings are already widely disseminated. Let the reader show us where we even said such a thing. Now, it's true he didn't say that. On the other hand, he certainly avoided the resurrection of the dead in many ways. Um, from the belief uh, that the, the world to come is a place where there are no physical bodies, we believe that is the truth, right? He spends quite a bit of time arguing that the world to come is a place where there is no physicality. Clearly, people did believe it was. And um, <clears throat> sort of proves from logic that in the world to come, right, going back and again and again to that statement of the rabbis that there's no eating and drinking in the world to come. So he says there can't be bodies there because you wouldn't need them. Um, okay. And then he, uh, he says that uh, we deny and we cleanse ourselves before God um of the accusations that were made against us um that the soul would never return to the body and that's impossible for it to occur and it says i didn't say that such a denial in the resurrection of the dead leads and he doesn't say because it's heresy he says such a denial in the resurrection of the dead leads to the denial of all miracles the Rambam does believe in miracles, although he does minimize them in some ways, and he sees them as part of the structure of nature, so they are only temporary. Um, but uh, here, it's a little bit hard to understand why the denial of the resurrection of the dead would mean you'd end up denying all miracles, like God speaking, or, well, not God speaking, let's say a splitting the sea, that sort of thing. Um, and the denial of miracles is equivalent to denying the existence of God and the abandonment of our faith. I guess the idea is that you need the resurrection of the dead to be the type of miracle that can occur, meaning it's time-delimited, 
um, and it's part of the physical structure of the world. Um, you know, if you get rid of it just because it's miraculous, so then you're stuck because you have to get rid of all the miracles, and he doesn't think you can do that, or nor should you. Um, for we do consider the resurrection of the dead to be a cardinal principle of the Torah. There's nothing in our writings that would indicate a contradiction to the return of the soul to the body. On the contrary, we show the opposite. Um, those who want to slander us and attribute to us an opinion which we do not believe um, will ultimately be judged by God. He says, and, you know, we've explained everything. You can't be misled. And he says, um, now he has to explain why he only mentioned the resurrection of the dead twice um, and in very short form. He says, since we find the words of the prophet cannot bear any meaning but the literal one about the resurrection of the dead, and that states the soul will return to the body, so we know it to be true. The truth of this narrative is not increased if one were to posit that every time the word resurrection occurs in the scriptures meant the return of the soul to the body. Nor would all the truth of this matter be diminished if one assumed that some or all of the references to resurrection, except this phrase, are allegorical. In other words, he says maybe some of the times when the prophets talk about the resurrection of the dead, it's allegorical. Maybe sometimes it's 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 literal. And that all we need is one literal instance. In the final analysis of the prophetic narrative is met with once or twice. Ancient modern sage of Israel mentioned it innumerable times. He says, I didn't mention it a lot because and it's not that many mentions of it that you have to take literally. And then he's going to say, you know, saying things a lot of times doesn't necessarily make them more true. And his example is that the Shema is only said once in the Torah, although it's actually said twice. Um, some people have raised doubts about our words at the end of the composition, meaning at the end of the Mishnah Torah. Now, this is good because we, we read this and it, it does seem like a big question, right? That when he describes the time of the Messiah at the end of the mission of Torah, he does not mention at all the resurrection of the dead. So how's he going to explain that? He says, this is, and in fact, he says that the Messiah will not resurrect the dead. I mean, that's the hard part. Do not think the King Messiah will have to perform signs and wonders, bring anything new, or resurrect the dead, or do similar things. So it sounds like he precisely believes that there won't, well, there will not be a resurrection of the dead at the time of the Messiah. So um, it says, but but in the Mishnah Torah, in the commentary on the Mishnah, I said the resurrection of the dead is a cardinal principle. So what do we do? This matter is very clear. There's no doubt that which we asserted that the Messiah will not be required to perform a miracle, such as splitting the sea or resurrecting a dead person in a miraculous way, means that a miracle will not be asked of him since the prophets, his prophecies have been verified and foretold his event. In other words, he didn't mean that there isn't going to be any supernatural stuff. There will be the resurrection of the dead, he's saying here. What he meant was the Messiah doesn't have to do it in order to prove himself. It does not follow from this treatise that the Almighty, at the time of his choice, he says, still, maybe God will want to do resurrection. Might be during the time of the Messiah, might be before him or after him. And the final analysis, nothing in our words in our composition, which could raise doubts about the resurrection, right? So basically saying it's true that, you know, the Messiah doesn't have to do it. And it might not come at the time of the Messiah, but we believe God will resurrect the dead because we have to believe that. It does seem kind of apologetic. Know that when we state these assurances and they're like to be understood allegorically, our words are not a decree for prophetic, right? All the times when I've said certain things are to be allegorical, um, like when the, he says, like when that the lion will lie down with the lamb, he says, um, he says, I'm not saying this is prophecy, that I know it to be true. Uh, and we don't have a tradition of what to explain allegorically and what not to. Um, I'll explain to you what brought me to this approach. And that is that our aim and the aim of every intelligent person um, for the most uh, uh, aim and uh, the aim of every intelligent person among the very few is the opposite of the aim of the multitude of people. For most cherished and beloved thing to the multitude of observant people, because of their ignorance, is considered the Torah and human intellect to be two opposite poles. He says most people, he says most observant people seem to think the Torah and human intellect are not put together. 
Everything which is incomprehensible to their intellect, they consider to be a miracle. They flee from explaining something as a natural phenomenon, whether it pertains to something recorded in the past or in regard to something which is discernible in the present time or whether it relates to something which is written in the future. In other words, people resist, at least people at his time resisted explaining things as natural phenomena. They liked the miracles. We, on the other hand, he says, strive to reconcile the Torah with human intellect and regard everything in its natural light whenever possible, unless it is self-evident that it is miraculous and cannot be interpreted in any other way. Uh, then we're forced to say it's a miracle. In other words, he's saying, my theology is that I don't want to consider things miracles. I like the laws of the universe. God should not be violated. So if you have to believe in a certain miracle, there's just no way to interpret it allegorically, then you do. But he says most people in his time actually want to interpret everything as miracles. And he does not like that. Um, give some examples. He says, it seems to me uh, people are When we discussed the resurrection of the dead, we did so in few, you know, only in few words. Now, now he's going to give a reason why he only said it twice. And he says it's because you don't have to write things a lot. First is our compositions are concise. He doesn't need to write with verbosity. Our intent is not to expand on the body of books or waste time. Therefore, when we comment on a subject, we just do it once. Second reason is that saying it a lot... Um, you know, sometimes you have to really explain things clearly and say them a lot in order to clarify them. Uh, this is needed. <laughs> this approach is needed for three types of wisdom, namely didactic science, natural science, theological sciences. Well, oftentimes the subject is obscure, but on the other hand, a miraculous event is not obscure. He says the resurrection of the dead is not something we're trying to understand the physics of it. He says it is what it is. So I don't have to say it a lot. I just say it once. That's how he explains that. You, the congregation of those who delve into our composition, already know that I attempt to reduce controversy and polemics. Were it possible for me to condense the entire Talmud into one chapter, I would not condense it into two. How can I? They want to clarify things, he says. And that's why I can't be asked to cite all the homiletical expressions and narratives as they're found that refer to the resurrection of the dead. Um, and he says, when we reach this point in this in this treatise, this was our ultimate goal. We saw the total lack of utility of expanding further on the resurrection of the dead. We just wanted to mention that it exists because such discussion would just be repetitive. In order not to leave the subject totally without benefit of new information, we're gonna discuss two things connected to the resurrection of the dead. The first is to elucidate the subject of those scriptural passages, which are very numerous, seem to prove that the resurrection of the dead is impossible. So this is interesting. He says, there's all these verses that actually say the resurrection of the dead is not possible. For instance, if a man may die, may he live again? As the cloud is consumed and vanish away, so he go to the grave and shall come up nevermore. Things like from Proverbs and Psalms. Before I go, whence shall I not return to the land of darkness? And from Job. He says, all these verses, right now he says, okay, now I'm in the position where I have to show that we're going to interpret all these verses metaphorically because they're about against the resurrection of the dead. But the wonder what he's saying. If one delves into the scriptural verses, one finds they all totally negate the resurrection of the dead, except for some literal interpretations in Isaiah. With a little reflection, it becomes clear there's no doubt as to whether such a verse in Isaiah is an allegory or really true. The following clearly stated verses in Daniel are also responsible for the great confusion among the people. As many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, right? So Daniel and Isaiah in some places talk about the resurrection of the dead, but there's all these other places in Navi, in Tanakh, where it, it seems to say there won't be. Some of these scriptural verses has resulted in great doubts about the fundamental principle of the resurrection of the dead. Even some of those who fully believe in this fundamental principle have been forced to explain each of them um, as allegory. That's the ones that are against the resurrection of the dead. The, the verses that are against the resurrection of the dead. 
That's the first question. Second question relates, right? So he doesn't really answer it. He just basically kind of says, here's all these verses against the resurrection, but you know, we'll have to interpret them metaphorically. Um, the second question relates to the fact that the Torah does not mention this fundamental principle at all, even in the form of an illusion, certainly not explicitly. If one thinks it's impossible that the Torah should not cite even illusions as a fundamental principle, um, how do we know the resurrection of the dead based on the Torah? The rabbis ask. Their intentions show that there are hidden illusions. So he says in response, I hereby state that the words of the prophet's language of the holy books are narratives describing the existence of nature in its usual manner. It's well known that nature as it exists includes the union of females of living beings with their males and the birth of offspring until that living being dies. It is not part of nature that that being return and exist after its death, right? In other words, here you see his problem with it. It isn't, it's not logical. It's not scientific. However, it's part of nature that when living beings die, they never return. They die, they dissolve, and they disintegrate into the elements from which they came. Man alone is endowed with the measure of godliness, and therefore of necessity, this part of him remains, does not perish, the soul. However, the body of man perishes. Person who searches vigorously into these deep matters can also provide evidence from searching proofs. This is something which, right? So he says the second question, right? The first question is you have all these verses that are against the resurrection. Right now it's interesting. He's in a position, he's already said, I believe in it. Now he's in a position of trying to defend it. He says, first of all, there's all these verses that indicate there won't be the resurrection of the dead. He explains those, says those take metaphorically. And then he says, well, you know, the obvious question, which is the body disintegrates. So we'll see how we'll answer that. Okay. I'll swap to 41. Have a uh, good Shabbos, everybody. Thank you. Does he ever, I don't know if I missed this, yeah. but does he ever explain that without corporeal assets, anybody could actually study anything? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if he thinks that in the world to come when you're just a soul that you're actually studying anything. I think what he thinks is that your intellect survives. Your intellect is sort of the soul. Um, but I don't know if if in the world to come there's studying. Uh, I'm not yes, sure. I think you mentioned about a few days ago about the pursuit of knowledge, a pursuit of Torah. So but that I think is in the physical form, no? Physical form, all right. I think so. Yeah, because what the rabbis, the verse he keeps, the line he keeps quoting from the Gemar is that the righteous will sit with crowns in their heads and have pleasure from the Shekhinah, from the divine presence, of the uh, closeness or distance from the divine presence. All right. So, when, and on the path of dealing with angels a few days ago, yeah. and as you mentioned in the, uh, the sermon, the part about the uh, angel that Moses sees in the bush. What is he looking at if there's nothing corporeal, just an image? That's a good question. I mean, the angels definitely do appear physically to Abraham, to others. Yeah. So that I think the Ram would say is a miracle. He does believe in miracles, but um, you'll see that he really tries to minimize them. And he tries to work them into, uh, like like he'll even say later on that maybe the, the lion and the lamb will get along in the time of the Messiah because... The natural thing is the world becomes more populated, the animals are going to get along better. That's what he says later. Um, so if he tries to, whenever he can, work in it, but he does believe in miracles. He just doesn't, and he doesn't say, he says here, he doesn't want to deny the resurrection of the dead because they need to deny all miracles. Miracles are all possible, but he doesn't want a miracle that's permanent. He doesn't want a miracle that violates the laws of nature. It's miracles you can work into the laws of nature even though they're unusual. Uh, you know, the wind blew and it blew the sea apart. That's what the Torah says. You know, it's so the fact that it happened at that moment was a miracle, but it itself really wasn't a miracle. You know, you, you, it works through the laws of nature. That's the idea. The resurrection of the dead will be a miracle. Um, and you can have miracles, according to Rami, it does believe in miracles, but they have to be short and you have to somehow if possible, fit into the uh, laws of nature. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.